Um, so my first question for Chip is, um, what was the genesis of this project? Was there a major uh, impetus for Through the Valley of the Nest of Spiders? And if so, could you tell us what it was? Well, that's actually a fairly easy one to answer. Um, um, the idea for the book goes back before I wrote my very, very first novel uh, to when I was a kid. Um, in um, um, 1958, um, as um, he later wrote about it in another novel, in 1958, Hurricane Lolita swept from Florida to Maine. Uh, and uh, the book, of course, uh, was a great bestseller. And in 1960, um, uh, Vladimir Nabokov was interviewed, and uh, I read the interview. And one of the things he talked about, uh, uh, the um, interviewer said, well, um, what does it feel like to have read, written this shocking novel uh, about a, uh, an adult man who has an affair with a 12-year-old girl? Uh, and uh, Nabokov said, there's nothing shocking about this novel, really. Um, if you really wanted to write a shocking American novel, what you would do is you would write a book about an interracial couple. Uh, and this interracial couple got married. Um, their children, they had children. Their children, or them, never had anything to do with drugs. They never had any problems with the police. Um, they uh, simply grew old. Uh, and lived happily and uh, to a ripe old age with their children and grandchildren around them. Uh, and that would be the truly shocking American novel. Uh, and this, this stayed with me from the time I was 18 um, through all the various 20-odd, 20 22, 23 novels that I've written. Um, and then back in the, um, at the beginning of uh, um, the, the, the um, oh, uh, the, the, the 21st century, it occurred to me, if I'm ever going to write the novel I want to write about this, I better start now. <laughs> so uh, I did, uh, I just, I started working on it, and for seven years I worked on Through the Valley of the Nest of Spiders. There's a little difference, however, from um, uh, Nabokov's um, uh, version of it. Um, the particular couple, the interracial couple, uh, are a gay couple of wor working class guys who live on the coast of Georgia. And they meet when uh, they are respectively 17 and 19. Um, and they live together and stay together happily uh, for the next 60 or 70 years. Uh, and uh, basically, that was the impetus. And, and it grew directly uh, from uh, Nabokov's comment. Uh, and I have tried. And from I gather from what some of the reviewers have ha said, they do indeed find some of it shocking. <laughs> Well, you've described the, uh, the book uh, as, as taking place in a, in a pornotopia. Uh, could you describe what a pornotopia is? Could you talk about that in relation to this? What, well, uh, what is a pornotopia? Uh, a pornotopia is a, just a, a quick term um, to sort of um, gen, gener, genreize um, the kinds of literature that we have. Um, um, Comedy takes place in the world of commedia. Tragedy takes place in the world of tragedia. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, and, uh, and pornography takes place in the world of pornotopia. Uh, and realism takes place in the world of realizia, <laughs> or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and, and when you think about it, um, um, and our lives take place in some way that's a, a place of all, of, of all three. Um, I get up in the morning. I, you know, I walk into the kitchen. I open the bat, the um, uh, the refrigerator door. The salami falls out on the floor. I pick it up. The door goes and swings and hits me in the side, knocks me over, and I knock the, the jar of capers from last night off onto the floor from the kitchen table. This happens to all of us all the time. But when we write it in the uh, when we write it in the um, uh, in in a, in a novel. We say, I went and I opened the uh, refrigerator door, and I got the, you know, and I got the half and half out and put it on the table, you know. Um, and we, we just leave all the slapstick comedy that takes, you know, takes place around us. We leave it out. Uh, and uh, and in the same way, commedia and tragedia, you know, that, that's the world of comedy. And tragedia is a place where everything goes wrong that could possibly go wrong. Uh, 
And the pornotopia, of course, is the place where any relationship can become immediately sexualized. Um, you know, you walk into the business office and you smile at the secretary uh, and she smiles at you and the next thing you know, you're having riotous sex on the desk. Uh, this is the world of pornotopia. Every once in a while, um, something actually occurs from pornotopia, but not all that frequently. You know, and so, um, pornotopia, and so, uh, yes, uh, when you write about explicit sex, often in the same way, you have to do a little juggling to make it, you know, to make it sort of fit into the story. And those little generic jugglings that you have to do um, create the texture of pornotopia. And so that's uh, that's basically all it is. Pornotopia is the place where pornography happens. <laughs> uh, um, if you write, if you if you do it properly, people don't realize you're, you're in pornotopia any more than they realize that you're in tragedia when you write a tragedy. They only recognize when they come out and have seen all the bodies scattered around the stage in the last five minutes of the last act, oh, this was, you know, this took place in tragedia. Uh, and so that's how, that's how all of these work. Uh, and it's just a quick way of, of, of implying well, a number of, of reviewers have noticed that there is an extraordinary amount of gay sex uh, in this novel and, and uh, of an extraordinary variety. Uh, Roger Bellin, in his review in the LA Review of Books, uh, makes this terrific point. He, he says that it's, it's very unlikely that any single reader is going to be turned on by everything that happens in the novel. And he, and he comes up with a terrific term uh, for describing this libidinal estrangement uh, as a description of how the novel works on the reader. Um, and I guess my question would be, how do you see your ideal reader's approach to this material? Well, um, if the, you know, my, my feeling is, is, is broad, and I have a whole range of possible, um, of, of what I think are more than acceptable responses. If it turns you on, go with it. Uh, that's one of the possible responses. Enjoy it for on, on that level. Uh, however, um, as um, uh, Bellin said, nobody could possibly be turned on by all of it, because I mean, some of it's diametrically opposed to you know to to other. Uh, and um, basically, I want the reader to look at it as though it is things that happen to the characters. Um, um, you know, they, it, you, you, you regard it in the same way as if you, they took a walk down by the ocean. You know, well, they had sex in this particular way at this particular time, and that you pay attention to it and see if you can see things that happen in the way that it occurs that tell you about their character. You tell you who they are. The sex is not there just to, you know, just to turn people on. If it does turn the on, that I see think, see that as a very secondary uh, result. I have nothing against that happening. I think that's fine. I think that I, uh, um, a lot of artists, especially in the early half of the, the 20th century, have felt that somehow um, a sexual response uh, undercuts the aesthetic response. Auden used to feel this way. I know, and I don't. Uh, I don't. I think that there's no nothing to prevent you from having both responses, um, either at the same time or you know five minutes apart, uh, as the case may be. So that's 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 my answer there. Well, there's there's also an enormous amount uh, of material in the, in the novel about food. Um, yes. There's this there's a focus there's a tremendous focus on food, and there's almost a sense that the whole novel is a is a kind of exploration of, of appetite, human yes. appetite. And I'm, I'm curious about what you had in mind with this particular focus. Well, it, it is a book about appetites, about all sorts of appetites. Appetites for food, appetites for certain kinds of experiences, which include the sexual. Uh, and, um, and that's because we are, um, we are the concatenation and the intersection of all of our appetites. I think that's you know, one of the things that we are. Uh, and learning how to deal and negotiate those appetites. Uh, some of them have to be held in, some of them have to be, can be explored, some of them you can have great fun with, some of them, uh, you, you know, all of them, all of them require some responsibility, I think, and that's, you know, um, and that's what, you know, and so that's what 
the experience is because that's a lot of the experience of life. Now, I think um, there is a great deal of sex. Let's go back to the sex thing. For, and as you said, there's also a great deal about food. Um, I, there must be, uh, there are at least half a dozen full recipes given, you know, uh, in the course of the novel about how to, uh, you know, how to do, ev do everything from um, um, from southern fry, southern southern grilled ribs uh, to coleslaw to you know you name it, um, uh, mashed turnips, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All these things are um, how to eat okra, uh, you know, boiled okra. They're all of this stuff information is there, and that's because you have to learn about the foods that you know are that are around you. You have to learn uh, how to negotiate them, and people do. Uh, and uh, but that's again because that's that's what I think people are are constituted by. They're constituted by their various appetites, and uh, and this all this is uh, this is all that should be there. As I said, I started to say there is a great deal of sex. Um, I don't think there is as much as some of the reviewers would lead you to to believe, though. Um, one young man in a in, in a in a sort of blog that he wrote. Uh, said at least 70% of the novel is taken up with sex. Uh, I don't think so. Um, it's probably, you know, in an 800 page novel, I would be really surprised if you actually counted there are more than 125 pages, you know, that deal explicitly and directly with sex, which is a lot for an 800, which is, which is you know, more than 10%. But it's not, you know, it's not, you know, it's not more than half. It's not even, a, it's not a quarter. It's not a third, and I think people sort of, you know, because of the um, proportion is larger than they're used to, um, it tends to make it the first time they go through it. It seems like there's even more, you know, uh, and I think it, 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 it gets. Uh, um, uh, there's a, there's one of the reviewers, and again, something that could only exist in the world of the internet. Uh, they go on and they go on about uh, one particular. This, you know, odd kind of sex, and finally somebody says, "Well, you know, there is actually after they've discussed it for seven or eight comments back and forth, you know, five or six pages, uh, somebody mentions, you know, well, there isn't any of that sex in the novel. It's only referred to, and it just happens off stage. It never happens explicitly. But again, if you read the, conver the conversation about it, you would think that that that, that it was, um, you know, it was." It, took up vast numbers of pages in the book. So this is the way a lot of that tends to work. Yeah. Well, uh, to, going with just the, the issue of vast number of pages, uh, uh, you know, a number of critics have mentioned that that the, the sheer length of the book and the amount of time that it does immerse us in the texture of the lives of the two main characters is a major part of what gives the book its emotional power. And uh, I guess my, my the question I've really been wanting to ask you is, uh, what is your hope in creating such an immersive experience in the lives of these two men in particular? Well, they are they are are are, are the kinds of people who are not usually written about. They're two working class men. Um, one of them is actually illiterate. One of them literally cannot read and write. Uh, and um, I think um, um, we. Well, the, 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 the way the novel has progressed historically, I think, uh, is to sort of each time um, writers and artists go around, um, they work to expand the circle of compassion. That's the way I talk about it when I talk about it in my classes. Um, uh, and to bring in more and more people. You read early novels, something like uh, John Gay's The Baker's Opera, uh, what became uh, the three-penny novel that became The Baker's Opera. Uh, and um, uh, there is no compassion for the working class at all. Uh, the, the working class is presented as thieves and layabouts and people that you shouldn't, you know, that you don't let into your house. Uh, they're all going to rob you blind if you give them half a chance, and if you give them any more than that, they will probably rape your sister. Uh, that's who the working class is, and is presented in these early novels. And then finally, people began to think, well, you know, maybe a little bit of of, of, of compassion could be spared for the working class. And, and if somebody was going to be hung, let's say, on the next morning, you could at least 
know, shed a tear, you know, for his wife and children, uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, but again, you look at you look at Balzac scheming peasants, uh, even as late as Balzac. Um, you have uh, sympathetic characters who are the children of peasants who are trying to better themselves. But the peasants themselves in Balzac are, you know, are just, you know, you, you just, uh, uh, you, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're monsters. Cechard um, in, in Les Illusions uh, Perdues is a, you know, is a, the, the, the old printer. Uh, he schemes against his son, his, you know, his, his every relative. Uh, he tries to get pent money out of everyone. He has no sympathy for anyone, and is, and is an evil old guy. Uh, and his son loves him, or claims to love him. And, and uh, but this is the way um, the early novel dealt with the working class. And and, and as but each uh, and each time you move on, uh, you you bring in more and more people. The, the novel, you know, by the time you get up uh, to um, um, uh, you know to um, George Orwell, or people like that, suddenly the working class, there's sympathy for the working class, and other people as well. Uh, and so you've got to, uh, and I'm just trying to expand uh, the circle of compassion just by a little more. Not a lot more, just a little bit more. Uh, and allow uh, people who have a couple of odd sexual kinks um, into that circle. Uh, and if, um, and you, you said, and I, I, in, in a way, that's a, a wonderful compliment that you found yourself very, you know, uh, very moved by the end of the novel, by by the, the, the history of of these two guys. Um, well, that's kind of the payoff, you know. That uh, uh, that's that's your way. That's that that suggests to me that I might have come near some success in what I was trying to do. Yeah. Uh, I'll follow that address a final question to you here, then we can um, uh, uh, pass, the, pass this on to the audience. Um, you're a, a critic as well as a novelist, and uh, in your Paris Review interview uh, in their Art of Fiction series last summer, you said that for the last 40 years of this 50-year career, as a writer, your major project has been that of promulgating a, quote, more sophisticated idea of discourse, end quote. Um, can you tell us how this new novel relates to that project? Well, again, um, it's that I don't, again, I don't think that's fundamentally a difficult thing to do. Um, the way you promulgate a more sophisticated, uh, sophisticated notion of what discourse is is fundamentally by promulgating a more sophisticated and nuanced notion of what human beings are, what human beings are capable of doing. You know, because discourse has entirely to do uh, with language. Uh, and, uh, and if you can talk about it, uh, you can then, you know, you are then doing it. Uh, and so one of the things that it tries to do uh, in you know one of the reasons the book is as long as it is and and very focused uh, on these two characters and really on one of the two characters it's not all focused on uh, it's it's focused mostly on Eric Jeffers uh, and it uh, is uh, <clears throat> and we see all sorts of we I try to show nuances and sides of his character um, that uh, and show them exhaustively. I, I, I go along with Mann's notion of that nothing is truly interesting except the exhaustive. Uh, and so I try to be exhaustive about it. Uh, and, and in such a way that it will hold the, reader, the reader's interest. <clears throat> and from the, from the reviews, it, none, nobody seems to have had too much trouble reading the book. Uh, they say it's a hard book to read, uh, you know, and, and I finished it the next day, you know. Uh, uh, so it's a, it's a strain. Uh, it's hard not on the level of, you know, not on the level of vocabulary and syntax, but it's, it's difficult perhaps to read on some of the content that you find yourself roller coastering through. Um, but if anything, it seems to draw people on through the actual text even faster, uh, for which I'm very glad. Uh, but as I said, it, it, you, if, as long as you are um, recomplicating the notion of what is allowed within the range of the human, uh, and you show it 
in on that way. Who was it who said that to um, um, to explain, you know, um, um, to uh, to understand everything and to sympathize with everything, you just have to explain it well enough. Uh, and so that's what you have to do. You have to explain stuff that might ordinarily be dismissed uh, and, and, and get people sort of thrown out of that circle, you know, in such a way that we can follow it, that we can say, gee, if I was in, you know, there, what is it there for but for the grace of, you know, uh, whoever. Uh, therefore, but for the grace uh, of uh, uh, Deus Sivi Natura, um, go I. Well, thank you very much. Uh, this would be a great place to open up this discussion. So please, if you have any questions.